Okay, let's go over phase four. Phase four. So phase four. You see S scan out. I'm grabbing a what's it grabbing? Integer. Yep. Some some number in the integer. Going to store that into a uh, an integer. Value pairs with one. So, what's happening here? What's that condition? Anybody online? Want to tell me what this condition is? Yep, checking the return value of S scan now, making sure that it, it got something. If it didn't, boom. Then we're checking var 4, which looks like that was, or we're storing it. So let's say that this is our. condition that jumps around the boom. So if one, if, if the number we enter is greater than or equal to one, making sure that it's a positive value. And we get down here to this function that after we return from it, we'll do a compare. And then based on that compare, we either boom or not. So, dive into this function, and this is where we have our recursion going on. So, before we dove into this, the question was asked, what is recursion used for? And I had to refresh my memory on this. But Basically, what it is used for is when you have a algorithm that lends itself to recursion. Uh, an, example, an example of that is going to be any number of sorts that use a divide and conquer mentality, merge sort, for example. Um, anything that you can use a, a divide and conquer style algorithm, or you can um, break down the problem, then um, and then you can use a, a recursive algorithm for. Uh, it is um, not necessarily going to be the most efficient in terms of memory utilization, but it may be the most efficient in terms of um, least complexity in writing. And uh, anyone who's written code can tell you the the less complex you can actually make your code, the easier it is to later on edit, as well as the easier it is to verify that you did it right. Um, recursion is also sometimes used to um, ascend trees and other graphs. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a really good example. 
Uh, for those online, if you didn't hear that, I mentioned that it's also good for using with descending trees and graphs. Okay, so you know we have a recursive function here. So I'm going to call this do recurse something. <coughs> Not sure what exactly it's doing, but it's doing something recursive. There we go. So, what's the first thing we try to figure out when we have recursion? Yeah. <laughs> when will this end? <laughs> exactly. Um, also called the base case. But yes, when will this end? Uh, so, what does it look like our base case is here? What was that? When it's when it is one, when it is less than or equal to one. So our base case is okay, less than or equal to one. You know what? I'm going to write this out. So I have my function do occurs and it takes a let's say a number and if it is less than or equal to one yeah there's a definite pseudocode mm -hmm. Combination of syntax here. Uh, if less than or equal to one, we are going to. What are we going to do if it's less than or equal to one? Magic. Magic. And we're going to make the magic dance. Magic dance. Yeah. Um, what are we going to do if it's less than or equal to one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make ex one, which then means. Yeah, return one. So, return one. Okay. So that's our base case. So, if it is not our base case, then what's going on here? We've got to take our first argument, well, our only argument. So we're going to do recurs on our, our argument minus one. Okay, so we're not sure if we're returning it, but I'll write in here do recurs on this one. I'm going to do something with that. Then what are we doing down here? Okay. Yep, do the same thing, but with n or arc zero minus two. So we're doing something to do recurs n minus two. So let's see that first one. You know, the the going to return in EAX, which we put into ESI. The second one is, again, going to return in EAX. And so we are taking those two values. Just to be explicit here, let me write this out, ESI equals dx equals, and then we are saying, mathematically, what is that saying? dx equals x. Yep. dx equals dx plus csi. 
and then we return that. Oh. Return ex. So here we go. So here's our pseudocode. So we can simplify this by doing some simple substitution. Okay. Anybody tell me, what does that look like? Fibonacci. Classic, classic Fibonacci sequence. Where our, uh, where what we're looking for is the summation of the two previous values. Uh, this is a very classic example of recursion. So, so we have, okay, so that's, that's what that, that function is doing. So now we can, we, oh, what's going on? I don't know what just happened. It's not letting me. I clicked something weird. Close that. And let's go back. Yeah, I hit some kind of button that made me go into select mode rather than move. Okay, so we know that this isn't just doing recursion, it's doing Fibonacci. Cool, so that's, that's a Fibonacci. If we go back and we say, okay, so it's, it's returning an EAX. So it's taking that return value, moving it to var e, local variable, and it's doing this compare. The 37 hex, and if it is, what is that? What's the compare doing? What's the, how do we make it go down to the success, jump around the boom? Yep, if it's, if it's equal. So we want to see what that value is in decimal H55. So when the Fibonacci sequence returns 55, and then we get our success. So what input value will give us a output of 55? There's a couple different ways to figure that out. First is do a, you know, make a, a table and then just list out the various values and kind of brute force it that way. Or you could write it up in, I don't know, Python or C, whatever language you prefer, and um, just say, okay, let me run through the different numbers and, and get it out that way. Um, so by hand or pseudocoding or coding it up. Or looking on Wikipedia what the sequence is. Or looking on Wikipedia. Or just guessing. Yeah. You know it's not that far in. So what what input value for the Fibonacci sequence gives us a return of 55? Nine. Nine. Nine as in that's the answer, not nine as in no. Thank you. I try. All right. So if we go over here, nine. Hey, we got that one. Try this one. 